Well, welcome everyone to the Brooklyn Rails 170th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Natalie Frank and Ong H. Bui. We're also thrilled to have the poet Gina Marie Lowe here who will read to close today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the, the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the calls for action and justice across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAddy, James Scarlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyn Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I in introduce today's guest and host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Natalie Frank explores contemporary discourse on feminism, sexuality, and violence. Her gouache and chalk pastel drawings of the unsanitized Brothers Grimm Tales brings back with Jack Sipes' translations aspects of incest, rape, and physical violence left out of our familiar stories. The 2015 exhibition at the New York's Drawing Center traveled to Blanton Museum, Austin, and the University of Kentucky Art Museum, Lexington. The current exhibit is at Half Gallery and is open through November 21st, and we will be sharing some information on it over in the chat. Fong H. Bui is an artist, writer, independent curator, publisher, and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. From 2007 to 2010, he served as curatorial advisor at MoMA PS1. Among many others, his recent projects include Artists Need to Create on the Same Scale that Society Has the Capacity to Destroy, an ongoing curatorial project, and most recently, We the Immigrants, a special project that we will also be sharing some information over in the chat. Without further ado, Fong, I hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for the nice introduction, a spirit introduction. It's nice to also uh, have Natalie here as part of our ongoing celebration of the Rail 20th year anniversary. Um, so I, I like to begin with the question, um, why do we have to remember things? You know, I mean, perhaps not everything, but selected things, be it unconsciously or consciously, it's just super hard to tell. For me, it's about being struck by something I was told to, then I would try to recite it in my head a few times or something I read with the same impression, I then would try to memorize it by repeating it until it enters my memory index, which I can use it when the time is appropriate, you know? I remember being so moved, for example, by Toni Morrison Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1993, for example, especially what she said at the beginning. Um, in the first sentence of our childhood that we all remember the phrase, once upon the time. You know, it actually is, is in my introduction of the anthology of artist interview that David Swerner books published a few years ago. I also love Georgia Stein on her that bed, lifted her head and asked, what is the answer? <laughs> you know, and when no one spoke, she smiled and said, in that case, what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> so all of us quite remember well, I think, as children, we treasure, or shall I say relish, learning about the world as being so strange and mysterious place, but we all wanted to understand how things work, you know? Maybe we even feel 
we have an ancestral need to be in touch with others in that world as soon as we can talk really you know that's that's when we begin to ask why and in fact we never stop <laughs> <laughs> so this is how i think of your work natalie ever since i was exposed to your show i think at mitchell in the in nash mm, wow in, long ago <laughs> yeah 2007 i think it's a year uh, after you graduated i think it must have been gandalf gavan mm -hmm who took me there, who I knew when he was a student of mm -hmm. Udi Fab at Bar, mm -hmm. you know, in the late 90s. And then I, of course, your show at the Drone Center in 2015, uh, The Brothers Grimm. Mm -hmm. That's since the two shows really anchor in my memory and I've been following your work ever since. Um, but the first thing before we, <laughs> get into your, you know, your work. We, we spoke last night briefly. I thought it'd be nice to share with, with, with all of our viewers, our audience here. Uh, we talked briefly about artists who make wonderful illustrations. Um, and perhaps we could show the same few example of illustrators mm -hmm. make equally wonderful illustrations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the question of why and how and for whatever reason, when an artist makes an illustration of a story, any story really, is more or less be considered as a legitimate work of art as opposed to the question or less or, or not at all consider a legitimate work of art when an illustrator illustrates a story, mm. which altogether is another whole other topic we yeah. might have to kind of wait on that goes. But meanwhile, let, 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 can, can we look maybe some of the uh, images that we agreed to choose, that we chose last night to show everyone here? Uh, Kyle, can you begin maybe with William Blake? And I would, would you, I don't know, I've, I've thought a lot as I've started to make these drawings based on literature and also publications in tandem about the differences between drawing and illustration, because I don't think of my drawings as illustrations. I think of illustrations as in service to the word. And um, I really try to interpret the stories and come at them through my own lens, often transforming them. For instance, in the Brothers Grimm, um, they're very, I worked from the 19th century on sanitized versions, and they were very much part of their 19th century patriarchal time. Mm -hmm. And I um, tried to transform them into kind of feminist um, stories through a feminist lens. I focused on the female characters, both kind of evil and divine, and changed some of the action, um, I think, by focusing on some of the elements that I wanted to focus on. Um, and so for me, there's there's a difference between drawing and illustration. Um, but I'd say Blake and um, Doré probably considered themselves artists as well as illustrators. So maybe I kind of fall into that category, but it's been kind of interesting as I've shifted um, from painting to drawing and then more into this interdisciplinary world where I'm making books and last year worked on a ballet. Um, that these distinctions are wavering a little bit for me. Yeah, it's so it's so odd uh, for for some of us. You know, we don't really care to think of in the differences. Really, mm. I know some people. Are. <laughs> <laughs> I really never really think of that way. Maybe in college I was. Mm. You, know, you were told certain thing in college and whatnot. Yeah. But to me, I mean, look at it, the, this image of Blake. We mm. appreciate the amazing um, ecstatic freedom, how he follow his vision, mm -hmm. the image appear in his head. And he sort of follow that pretty much, you know? Um, the power of this, the, the story is what he really wanted to get to. And I know that he, he despised the kind of rationality and the, 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 the whatever the scientific method of thinking that justify through reason. I know mm -hmm. he hated, you know, he just never really felt comfortable with the age of enlightenment. 
So I thought it would be nice just to show the, the image of, of this kind, just to, to, just to, to launch our sort of thinking about how artists generate image in general. You know, in mm. which point would you consider censoring thing? How do you locate figures? I was interested looking at your um, composition. So we will get to that minute. But um, can we see the next one, Kyle, quickly? Yeah, so this is uh, someone who you and I admire too, um, a Swiss painter who also make drawing and also wrote beautifully, had a significant influence on Blake. I think he, yeah, I think he's definitely easily uh, nearly 10 years older than Blake. But mm -hmm. you can see how the idea of um, how, how you, how could I say it? He loved the supernatural and prefer the images on this ideal scale. A certain amount of exaggeration is necessary um, when it need to. Mm -hmm. I just love that spooky dwarf that's sitting on top of her, you know? Yeah, it's interesting in both of these images, um, both artists really guide the viewer as you would a storyteller in yeah. terms of like my eye starts from the horse, goes to the demon and then down to the woman and then vertically through her arm. And I think a lot about um, the paintings in the Brancaccio Chapel where Masaccio, really at the beginning of the Renaissance um, was that image of, I think it was, um, Peter healing the sick and the idea being there were figures that were passing each other and it was the moment where they passed each other that was supposed to be the moment of the miracle. And you're kind of forcing the viewer to become a reader and um, intimating kind of this idea of magic. And I think that's where my interest in storytelling kind of started. Um, mm -hmm. and Fuseli and Blake do that really um, cannily as well. Yeah, and let's look at uh, uh, Gustave Dory, for example. Fantastic image. Who also drew Don Quixote, illustrated Don Quixote. Oh, he was prolific. Jesus, I think he <laughs> illustrated Cervantes, of course, yeah. Rabelais, and Balzac, Milton. Bible. Okay, several times the Bible. Yeah. Even Edgar Allan Poe. Yep. Yep. I, know. I should go get to work. Yeah. Hello. Can we see, what's the next one for us, Carl? What do we have next? Oh yeah, I once had this print, this lithograph. I believe it's called the Connoisseur, yes. Amazing, uh, another instant where I think toward the end of his life that people began to take his painting seriously. It wasn't for border layer advocacy, it would have been different stories, remember, Natalie? Hmm. It's interesting how small he makes uh, the female head there. Of course, her arms are chopped off. Um, everything he did had such um, political and social meaning behind it. And uh, I love his work. Yeah, and that's partly because he just, uh, he made images every day. He work, was producing incredibly fast rate of, uh, production, you know? Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, yes, what's next uh, for us, Carl? Mm. All right, so this is another, I think of the use of color, unusual subject, of course, not afraid of tackling this uh, mythology, mythological narrative. And pastel, such a and great- pastel, yeah, the use of pastel. Um, I think you spent a year in Paris, am I right? I spent a summer at the Beaux-Arts um, studying figure painting. I think having been basically kicked out of Texas for being a pornographer, I was hungry when I was young to go to different countries and try to get in front of the naked figure to draw it. So, yeah. You must have spent some time at the, the Gustave uh, Moreau Museum, no? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. His, his teacher. Um, yeah, and then we're gonna move to the American, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, so this is uh, the classic uh, Norman Rockwell. 
And uh, it just, uh, I guess we decided to put this one in because, because what? A lot of men. I don't know. Maybe because <laughs> of the nostalgic for the 50s, perhaps, when he was so largely admired for his illustration in uh, the Saturday Night Evening Post, remember, for nearly five decades, really. Mm -hmm. Great artist. Great artist. And I, well, yeah. you know, you and I loved it, loved the work. Not so many. Uh, I don't think it wasn't for a Robert Rosenblum retrospective of the Guggenheim decade um, uh, uh, ago. It would have been a different story again, you know, but Theo, in a certain embodiment of the ultimate American idealism of life after World War II, really, mm. uh, in the 50s, you know. What do we have next, Carl? Okay, so this is Maurice Sendak. A big favorite of mine. Yes. When do you discover his work? I, I think I was read his books when I was a child. Every night my father would read to me. And um, then I started thinking a lot about him. I interviewed Tommy Unger um, when he had a show at the Drawing Center years ago. And Sendak, I think, was a sort of mentor um, for him. And I mm. talked to him about Sendak. And then the um, was it the Morgan that had that amazing show of his drawings and set designs. And I was working on a ballet at the time and was just in awe of his, I mean, all of his work, but also his um, opera and ballet designs. That's right. This is the one of the scene of uh, Mozart, the magic <laughs> flute. Mm -hmm. That was the show that you referred to. And now we are getting to one of your favorite painter, very <laughs> <of sugar>. yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes, tell us more about Paula. So I met her, I was, um, when I was undergrad at Yale, she had a show at the Yale Center for British Art. There was a, co a collection of the School of London that was being shown. And I was very earnest and I went up to her with my photographs of my work and I said, hi, I'm an artist. She was so <laughs> kind to me and we ended up writing letters and then visiting. Um, I would go to see her in London once or twice a year. She would come to New York and come to the studio and so it's been a really long, probably 15 year, 20 year friendship. Um, and when I last saw her in London, she's just so hilarious. You never know kind of what's gonna happen. She invited me to the studio and I came and she said, you know, there was with her, it's, you know, no hello, just take off your clothes, put this on. And she gave me this Victorian dress and I ended up posing for her for about half an hour and then nothing else was said and we had lunch and visited and about six months later I got a package in the mail and she had made me into a lithograph for her Jane Eyre series cool. and, then, and my face holding up Jane Eyre to be inspected by Mr. Rochester and then a couple months later I got another package and the British government had made five of them into British postage stamps. And my face then was on <laughs> a British postage stamp. And wow. in true Paula fashion, she made the women first class stamps and the men second class stamps. So That's I was on a first class stamp. <laughs> <laughs> but she's wow. been a tremendous influence. She was, it was in her studio that um, we, were, we always talk about what we're reading and what we're working on. and. Um, she's, of course, worked with fairy tales her whole career and literature. And um, so she was the one who suggested that I look at the Brothers Grimm years ago and make drawings out of, out of them. She said she wouldn't have time to do it, but that I should. Um, and so that's how that started. And it was the first series where I worked directly from literature and it was my first book and um, dedicated it to Paula. Um, so she's been a tremendous influence and just kind of personal um, beacon mm -hmm. because I had never met, especially a woman who had made a career and a life out of art. And I, I, I learned a I've learned a tremendous amount from her. Well, especially that she already embraced you and saw your talent and urged you on to become a painter. And of course, go on to investigate and illustrate um, you know, 
the whole the whole brother Grimm episode, but um, it's fantastic. In life, we need a mentor like that, you know? Yeah, we do. And especially, I think, for women. I've been fortunate to have a few really strong women who are just, who changed my life. Um, Paula is one of them. Linda Nochlin was one. Um, Elizabeth Sackler's been one. So it's, I think it's really important um, for women and it's, it's probably the, the most important reason why I enjoy teaching. Um, mm -hmm. If I can help young women um, in the way I've been helped. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, reading your tribute when Linda passed away in the rail in uh, 2015. So I knew right away that you have that um, strong relationship with her. Yeah. Like the way I feel I do with Maya Shapiro. Mm. So we're, lucky. we're lucky to have a um, mentor of such yeah. distinction and, you know, they kind of look after us and they're not afraid to give criticism criticism either when it's needed. <laughs> <laughs> That's mentor is about. So yeah. this is, which brings me to, to this painter who sort of underappreciated, Irvin Petlin. Mm -hmm. This is the photo of Maya Shapiro, and that's how I met him. Mm -hmm. And uh, partly, I just, just wanted to show everyone here, just because the use of color and pastel so much remind me of your own application of oh, the you. medium. Um, yeah, he's terrific. He's probably known for his um, iconic anti-Vietnam War post poster, which we have one here in the office, mm. and Babies in 1969. Mm. Yeah, Irvin's great. Irvin was part of that. Um, I think he founded the artist protest movement against the war in Vietnam mm. and collaborated with the Suvro, Liam Gollop and others. Mm. You know, missed him quite a bit. Um, what, what the next one, Carl? We have, yeah. So this may be the last one. Why do we put this here? You remember, Natalie? Um, well, you all have been championing Philip Gustin, but I think a lot of artists really and a lot of people were quite upset about the cancellation of the show. Yeah. And um, you know, I for one feel it's it's always time to speak up about things, however difficult they may be um, in whatever form. And mm -hmm. Justin is a prime example of that. Yes. But, you know, art, art has to take chances and if it upsets people along the way, fantastic. <laughs> yep, yeah. yeah, this, is, this is the Philip Gustin himself, this guy's in uh, the hooded Klansman. Mm. Uh, making a painting in the studio, being caught red-handed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the embodiment of the evil impulse from within, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I don't understand. This is the part that our society is incapable of acknowledging. Instead, we tend to make reductions, simplistic reduction, mm. even at the expense of diversity in the light of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. where diversity is solely invested on the diversity of race, the diversity of gender, mm -hmm. and so on, and totally cutting off the diversity of opinions, of mm -hmm. viewpoint, yeah. of anything that is considered as complex as the, the big elephant in the room that no one noticed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. A couple of years ago, I did a show of the story of O, and it was meant to be at a gallery run by a woman. And she, this was right after Me Too, as Me Too was starting, right after Harvey Weinstein, all of that news um, hit the press. And I had just written a piece for Art News about kind of my decade of sexual harassment in the art world and um, was getting ready to have the show. And I've read Story of O since I was 15, probably every year or so. Yeah. And it's always been a beacon of kind of sex positive feminism and the female um, dealer was um, censored and, and canceled the show. And so I moved it to um, Half Gallery actually. So that was the first show I did with them. And it was really, I was shocked that art could still 
upset people so much. The idea that, you know, art like Gustin or a story of O drawings could, would trigger women or trigger people. Um, you know, for me, art's always been a way to start a conversation. What's crucial for Hep Gallery uh, taking you right on at that moment you needed yeah. it. Yeah. The work. Yeah. So, um, can't wait to see the show really. So yeah. let's now, let, can we go to the first image of Natalie? And I wanted to begin my first question. Um, I know that you read a great deal as a child, you know, mm. as you mentioned in, in one interview. Can you share with us, like, which book that you remember, you know, that left a lasting impression, which at some point compelled you to want to tell the story as a painter? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I read, I read so much as a child. I think it was a way to escape and to, I, I sensed early on, I kind of wanted to live in a world of imagination where things were possible that I didn't feel were possible in everyday life. I think growing up, I was born in Austin, but grew up in Dallas, which was a very conservative place. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a lot of pushback from my interest in um, nude figure drawing, which I started very young. And my mom took me to this woman's garage outside of school, of course, um, to draw the nude model. And I would bring the drawings back to my school and get in trouble. And they kept me out of the honor society. And um, I think throughout all of that and seeing kind of what I felt was a very conservative community around me that didn't feel like it aligned with my um, ideals, that drawing, um, reading and then drawing was a refuge. But it was really, I think it was artists who first drew me in to the idea of reading paradoxically. So artists like Kate Kalvitz, um, the German expressionists like Max Beckmann, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Austrian expression, Kakashka, um, this idea of like you could look at a Beckmann and read a painting like you would a book. Yes. And that was, um, I had never really encountered anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. In the way someone like Kata Kalvitz told stories where she would use her personal life images of herself or her husband or children to talk about socialism or protest or feminism um, mm -hmm. was something I really admired. And so I kind of grew up, you know, from being a young girl into a young woman with being exposed to this idea that if you didn't, if you didn't want want to just be limited by the world around you, there was a way to enter into other worlds. And simultaneously, it, for me, it was through literature and through art. And I remember reading, you know, D.H. Lawrence or Story of O. Um, a lot of the magic realists were really important to me. Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Allende. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, um, they were my friends growing up. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. And you, your mom sounds like a, an amazing, open, <laughs> adventurous person because she took you to a, a drawing class when you were only 13. I mean, you were making in the same, you know, drawing class from a, a live nude model. Mm -hmm. At one point you were saying that his genital was about six inches from your head. Everyone thought that was funny. Um, so too. <laughs> he, uh, it was all like 65 year old women in this woman's garage and um, he hung from the ceiling. I still remember his name, Alexander, and from a, like with a, with a long pole, yeah. he suspended himself and it was, it was just like right in front of me and everyone just thought it was so funny and I just started to draw. I didn't really, that was it. I think it, 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 at least it was in the garage because that would be <laughs> illegal elsewhere. Am I right? <laughs> Definitely. We probably would have been shot. Uh huh. Okay. So you grew up with that kind of, uh, um, I guess, exposure. Exposure. Very liberal parents. My mom was working with Planned Parenthood. My father is a pediatrician. They sort of just always exposed me to, um, you know, the world and, um, encouraged my uh, desire for independence. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. so I was fortunate, I'm fortunate. 
So you make art. I mean, you obviously have a ferocious love for drawing or painting even when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, yeah. And um, went to study when I was young at the Slade, which was a really important place for me. Um, yeah, to why, why Slade, Natalie, and not elsewhere in America? In the US. I think, you know, my mom is really amazing. She, when I started to have trouble in middle school because of my drawings, they really hassled me and tried to kick me out of um, middle school and high school for being a pornographer. And I mean, I would get grants through the school, I'd win awards and then find out the politicians connected with them, you know, voted against the NEA or were yeah. um, speaking out against. Um, women's rights and I would return the awards. And so she, I don't know who she called, but she, she found the Slade and said, do you wanna go? And um, I think there weren't many places that were teaching drawing from life um, in the States. And maybe the idea of shipping me off to London was more appealing than New York. <laughs> um, but I went when I was 15 and then again when I was 17 and fell in love with the School of London, the history of um, artists like Stanley Spencer and um, Peter Blake and uh, Lucian Freud and Paula Rigo and what they were doing with the body and how they were telling stories. Yes, in fact, one of them being Frank Albach, mm -hmm. subject will be our um, Ants as Ease, I think next Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> That's great. I'm excited about to, to talk about his work too. Yeah. Uh, but meanwhile, can we, yes, can we talk about this series, which is currently up at the Hap Gallery? So mm -hmm. we're very happy to have this channel look at these images. Why, hopefully, you can make some comment. The, mm -hmm. the impulse to, to illustrate Don Quixote, did it come from a natural part after having done the others, or was it something else? I think it was, um, I wanted to make work that felt like it captured where we, where we were and where we are in America. Yeah. And um, I remember reading Don Quixote in Texas, of course, in Spanish when I was growing up and thinking, oh, what an optimistic, you know, almost like an artist figure who went out in search of adventures and created his own worlds. And as I reread the book, I thought this is a delusional man who <laughs> suffers from extreme arrogance, thinks he's going to save the world and women and mm. goes out just making a mess and destroying everything in his path. And the arrogance and um, the blindness and that seemed to capture for me where we are, where we've been for the past four years. This maniac who is leading us around on misadventures and just screwing up the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is kind of the perfect image to show talking about this work. Um, I photograph people and, and light and dress them and basically use models, um, but who tend to be friends. So this is a lovely friend of mine, um, but he seemed like you know, he could be related to Steve Mnuchin and maybe he's in the Trump administration um, that he just, he just felt like Don Quixote. Um, and so I cast Don Quixote and I cast Sancho Panza, who's more of a comedic buffoon and resonated more with me. Um, and this was the first body of work that I haven't um, focused on women and women's bodies. And, um, you know, post kind of Me Too, post the show that I did with Half Gallery, the Story of O show, um, I wanted to, to picture men. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned Steve Mnuchin because when he became this, <laughs> the treasurer, we were all shocked. <laughs> we knew that he's the son of the, of the Robert Mnuchin, mm -hmm. the prominent dealer, where yeah. Half Gallery is across the street. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right. Just, just as uh, most people, most of us pay so much attention to Trump, but you know he's really a, a product of all creation, I should say, um, of and Andrew Breitbart, you know, mm -hmm. who died in 2012. I met him in the late 90s, would you believe it, in some weird party in Soho. Mm -hmm. I always remember him. 
he can be one of the people we know. <laughs> you know? Uh, can we see the next one, Kyle? Yes. So this is the first drawing from the series when Don Quixote is sitting in his library discovering books, thinking, I should go and do this. I can go and be a hero, like the tales of chivalry that I'm reading in my library and think about all the women I can save and adventures I can have. And mm. you know, I try to make him into a buffoon. Um, there's a little stuffed sheep beside him and a devil, of course. Um, and these women who are pulling open the curtain and I think revealing who he really is. <laughs> And the man looking from behind facing us? The, the little yellow devil? Yeah. With a steaming pile of coal? I think he's, I always tend to have a figure that's kind of telling the viewer, this is what's gonna happen. And I'm gonna take you through. And that's, so it's the beginning. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I know that you, uh, you after Slate School, um, I know that you went to, Italy for a couple of years to study mm -hmm. um, in Umbria and in Florence as well. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's a. I don't remember having seen so many, so much study. From well, <laughs> in all fairness, it was just summers, um, and I was very fortunate at Yale. I had a head of my college, um, though being an engineer was incredibly supportive of the arts and has been a really um, a mentor for me as well. And um, every summer he found some grants and gave them to me and said, go, you know, go travel, go learn about painting and art. And um, so I was really fortunate to kind of squeeze it, squeeze it in in the summers and be able to do that. Yeah. Um, what was your experience like at Columbia? Oh. Um, Graduate school. I mean, it just seems so different than the rest of places you study. Yeah, it was, I had never spent time in New York um, and it was a very small program. You know, it was an odd time to be in graduate school. I had a lot of um, really talented classmates who've gone on to do really interesting work and have wonderful careers. Um, and, um, but it was the height of the art market. And so it was kind of an odd time to be a student. People weren't yet talking about the business of art and you know, I remember one day I left my studio to go to the bathroom and I left it unlocked. And when I came back, there was a reporter in my studio. And um, that was sort of what it was like. It was, it was very difficult to make sense of this business of art that was growing around especially young artists. But we had an incredible group of teachers, um, Jerry Saltz, Lynn Cook, Kara Walker, Collier Shore, we just had incredible access to um, contemporary artists and critics. And I had just never been exposed to anything like that. I had studied in different places, but it was always just kind of rigorous life drawing and painting. And this was a totally different type of education. Also the education of living in New York. Um, I had, I had moved to New York after college and worked at the Met for the curator of modern and contemporary art, Nan Rosenthal, who mm -hmm. uh, brought in the Jasper Johns white flag to the museum, was the Johns and Rauschenberg scholar. And that was an incredible year. Um, I met you know, her friends and got to see how uh, museum exhibitions were made kind of top to bottom and learned how to write, put together shows. Um, and the following year I was in Norway on a Fulbright and um, I lived there for a year and just painted. So it was great to come back to Columbia, be back in, you know, be, be in New York where I had a sense I wanted to live. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it was certainly different from the more sequestered, cloistered work I had been doing. Yeah, I should mention that Nan, to whom you met, Linda Nocklin also. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they were very close friends right. and she would have crazy New Year's Eve parties every year. And Linda was the only one who would talk to the assistant. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how we got to be friends. She would, she would like spread out on this divan with hot pink hair and sequins um, and was just wonderful. 
Yeah, was Josephine Halverson or M Dash or Francesca Di Di Matteo yeah. there? Or All they... of them. Wonderful artists, wonderful women. Yes, absolutely. Dash is a really good friend of mine. Okay, got yeah. it. I yeah. I can imagine the class. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, did you? I know that you have this admiration for Paula Rigo, uh, mm -hmm. who made abstract painting. Mm -hmm. from the very beginning of her career yeah. before turning back to figuration. seemed very fluid. Mm -hmm. Did you ever make abstract painting at all, Natalie? No, but I think um, having seen the bravery of, of turning from abstraction to this figuration with her dog women in those pastels, mm -hmm. I think about that a lot as I've moved away from painting on canvas into drawing into books into paper making um sculpture you know ballet it's a kind of risk taking that um she set a standard for in my life um mm -hmm. so i've never successfully worked with abstraction but i think that idea of um shape shifting through yeah. different media is really inspiring yeah I mean, not not to 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 mention that someone like Balthus have I ever made an abstraction, although he understood it quite quite well. So I assume mm -hmm. you do, which I think that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, when you talk about you know how space between the figure that would define their consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, what I, do? I read last night on the same breath as to locating them in space, mm -hmm. which to me, both are part of one similar condition. You know, uh, whether it be in figures depicted in the Renaissance, Baroque, Impressionism, mm -hmm. Impressionism, or figure being depicted after Cubism, or mm -hmm. Scripturalism, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you mentioned that you, you were interested on how the viewer position to what is being depicted in the picture. Mm -hmm. you mean, do you mean in regard to cropping device, for example, how Degas and Impressionist paint, painters were being influenced by the advent of photography mm -hmm. from the early 1840s and onward? Mm -hmm. mean, I think, um, yeah, sorry. You mean uh, cropping, that's where I'm... That's where um, I'm cropping, but also like how you're gonna use space to tell a story and guide the viewer around the page and what information you need. And also, um, because I don't really think of these as illustrations, um, you know, where is the information and what characters are we going to identify with? And how am I gonna allow the viewer to be sympathetic or non-sympathetic to different characters? And so in a drawing that might look like you know, some figures are more rendered and some are more caricatured and um, some are flat or some are colorful. Or for instance, in this drawing, the man with his back to the viewer, is that a window? Is it, um, mm -hmm. you know, an image? Um, what's being replicated? What's real and what's not? And I think that's kind of at the crux of certainly this Don Quixote work where madness and, and reality are slipping around. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. matter what's real and what's not. Yeah, I really like the fact that you left his, uh, the bottom of the man facing to us on the right there, mm -hmm. unfilling in with the, the red pigment. Mm -hmm. That's marvelous. Um, okay. Cool. Kyle, can we move the next to the next series? Yes. So this is, uh, this is, I believe, it's Tale of Madam. These are the, the these are drawings based on the tales of Madame Delnois, who was yeah. a 17th century French feminist literary fairy teller. And she invented the word fairy tale. Yeah. She wrote a version of uh, Cinderella, which are these drawings, Finette Cendron, um, about, you know, 150 years before the Grimm's. Um, and in her versions, they're archly feminist stories. So Cinderella says, you know, I'll marry the prince, but I want to stand up in front of the whole kingdom and tell my oral story and you all are going to listen. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of women are shape shifting into animals or they have lovers who are turned into animals because they lie or they cheat. Mm -hmm. And then some women, you know, don't tell the truth or honor their promises and they die or they're turned into animals. Um, but she was a very important writer around the time of Perot, who's more well known because he's a man. Um, but she was one of the first to sign the front piece of her work and claim authorship. And a lot of her characters, female characters are artists and storytellers. Um, so this book will come out in March with Princeton University Press. And it has um, 33 large drawings like this and then a couple hundred pages of marginalia. With the introduction and translated by Zach Zipes. Jack Zipes, and then I wrote a preface um, for the book as well. Um, and yeah. so this is, so every page has these kind of drawings um, that run throughout the text. And um, this will be, I'm getting ready for a drawing survey show in June, and this will be the last body of work in that show. Where will be the survey, be, um, the it, survey where will be? The Madison Museum of Contemporary Art in Madison, Wisconsin. Leah Kolb is curating it and um, we're hoping it will travel to one or possibly two other venues. And right. there'll be a book alongside it. Um, Alison Gingerest is writing the essay and um, then different contributors. So I'm really, I'm excited to see this. It'll gather all the book work, um, about 45 drawings, and then we'll screen the ballet as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, keep going, Cow. On the, you know, the, the, okay, this is a terrific one. That's Claire Gilman from the Drawing Center. <laughs> Always recognize her. She kindly posed for me for all of the drawings for Cinderella. And then ended up being put on the cover of the book as well, um, which we're all very happy about. Who's the curator of your show, uh, the, 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 the mm -hmm. Grimm's Tales. Right. Drawing Center, right. yes. Um, on the subject of um, sexuality, um, human, you know, repression and other form of social taboo and so on, mm -hmm. um, you, you've been consistently making consequential, um, near offensive <laughs> images when you were a child. <laughs> People didn't understand the work in Austin or Dallas, uh -huh. uh, but obviously it didn't prevent you from doing it, Natalie. No, I think it only made me want to do it more, which, mm -hmm. you know, I think some people don't understand when you, um, when you censor someone that the risk is they're going to come back harder um, and, and stronger. And I think that's um, mm -hmm. what I've done from an early age. Yeah, all of the money we pour in to put people in prison, just, you know, smoking marijuana, right? Or all decades. <laughs> no. in their bodies, it's, you know, um, I think we've seen incredible resistance in the past four years. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that it seems democracy is alive and well, and people are speaking up and standing up for what they believe in. Um, so whether it's on a personal professional level, um, communal level, it's wonderful to see. Yeah, you mentioned Linda, whose life is really dedicated on such advocacy and yeah. defending for all of that complexity of um, any issue of feminism. But I remember talking to her a little bit too about Jonas Makers, mm -hmm. um, who was being addressed I think put in jail for the weekend when he showed Jack Smith flaming creatures. Um, he was arrested on obscenity charges, you know? And I think he was, yeah, I think he was arrested once more after he showed uh, Jean Genet Unchan La Moi, which <laughs> is even more intensely erotic. Mm. Than, even when you're not erotic human being, you might definitely feel erotically charged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. I don't know if you've seen it, just short film, you know. Yeah. The, the plot is just set in a friend prison and 
where the prison guard takes this uh, voyeuristic pleasure mm -hmm. in observing the prisoner perform, you know, m masturbating really. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a war separate the two prisoners together. Uh, I, I say no more, but when it was shown, he, he was put in jail and it went to Supreme Court. And one week, the Senate, the Republican senator demanded that he would make, uh, would make several copies so they can study over the weekend. Would you believe it? Yes, I would. <laughs> I mean, I think so much of what I'm interested in in art and in my own work is showing that these cruelties, this sexuality, this violence, which may seem extreme in fairy tales or erotic novels or Genet or Saad, is part of everyday life. It's just a matter of magnifying it. And I think there's a freedom in um, exploring these ideas, especially in the realm of art and imagination and a catharsis that's really important to um, Mm -hmm. the communities and that's if you know if I could say that's that's the thing I want my work to do um, that's what I think fairy tales have historically done as women's oral tales they've allowed women to talk about their fears and desires and anxieties in a way that feels safe yeah and the liberty that you also able to deploy uh, the, 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 the use of scale mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, which mm. we were happy to show mm. Willem right in the beginning, you know? <laughs> yeah. when, when the need, I think, to tell the story, you find a way to do so, mm -hmm. regardless of these differences in how images are portrayed in, in terms of different scale and whatnot. Can we yeah. see the next image? Yes. Something changed here, when <laughs> you, which this is what I noticed too, Natalie. Every, uh, every book illustration or tell the story mm -hmm. seem to to um, somehow render a different temperature of uh, emotionality. Mm. Thank you, know? you. So I think this is all together, you know, you notice the shift of it, mm -hmm. of that temp emotional temperature. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about this series. So this is the story of O. This was um, the series I referred to that was supposed to be shown and then was censored and then moved to half gallery. And this yeah. is, uh, kind of well-known iconic story about a woman who goes to a dungeon sex castle and really learns about her um, sexual desire, learns about herself and for experiences freedom, um, ironically through different forms of servitude and rebellion. Mm -hmm. And it explores relationships between men and women, between women and women, between older women and younger women, all sorts of different power structures. And mm -hmm. it's an interesting book in that it was written in 1954 and the woman who wrote it, um, Pauline Riage and Declo, wrote it under a pseudonym and waited about 40 years to reveal her identity in a, in a piece in The New Yorker. And she wrote the book as a parody of pornography and to show that women had erotic imaginations. And she wrote it as an intellectual love letter to her partner who was the head of the French publishing house Gallimard where she was a well-known translator. Mm -hmm. And um, as, a term, as a means of intellectual seduction and I've always loved the book. I've, I love the power structures it examines. Um, you know, it's not meant to be taken as woman goes to sex dungeon, woman's whipped, um, woman dies. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's in, in, you know, Susan Sontag uses this book to talk about the difference between art and pornography, this being art. And um, I think after working with a few of the fairy tale collections, I wanted to explore what I saw as similar ideas in contemporary subject matter. Yeah. And it just so happened that, you know, I finished this work as Me Too was, was beginning. Um, yeah. But certainly the things that Me Too, the structural imbalances that Me Too was seeking to address are themes that have run through my work since I started drawing and painting at 13. Um, so this body of work is very special to me and I made a book um, surrounding the exhibition 
be to, to really address the history of the book, why it was important now or then, um, and why it was important to me personally. And yeah. so these are a few drawings from that series. So you, uh, uh, Natalie is referring to uh, Susan Sontag classic, The Pornographic Imagination, in mm -hmm. case some of you haven't read it. But I also noticed, this is a technical question, mm -hmm. Natalie. So most of these uh, paintings are first painted flatly with gouache, um, or some other cases, in this case, you know, it's not flatly painted with gouache. But and then you would modify it and render on top certain passages, not all, mm -hmm. uh, with pastel. Mm -hmm. And tell us more about that combination, why it, it works for you, why you prefer this mixed media. Yeah, it's, um, I work one on top of the other. So there's no um, system of working. It's kind of just, I have an idea. It's weird, I have really strong synesthesia. And so when I read, images come to mind. Yeah. And I discovered this with the Grimm's fairy tales first. Um, and so this image, the image comes to mind and then I just kind of go, there's no sketching. I work really quickly um, and it's a lot of layering, but I think I like the tension between um, the way that the gouache sinks into the paper mm -hmm. and it becomes almost passive. Mm -hmm. And the way that the chalk really activates the surface, I use a really thick watercolor paper and stays very buzzy and, and kind of moves on the surface. Right. And I like that tension. Right. Because as, yeah. as you know, I think there's a certain extent you can't really build too much on pastel because it's just fall away. Well, I, I, I work these pretty heavily. It's why I use, it's I think a 300 um, pound watercolor paper or I, grand watercolor paper. And I've never had a drawing destroyed, but I've had a lot of complaints about pastel <laughs> falling off the drawings in transit. <laughs> um, so, uh, are these are these three? I mean, are they co press? I, I assume they are co press, not it, hot press. It's a hot press, rough arches watercolor paper. I see. Cool. All yeah. right. Uh, yeah. How can we go to the next one? Yeah, this one is super different than the rest of them. <laughs> oh. Um, this was the final scene from the book when she, O, oh, is clothed in an owl mask and left for the commander who comes and has his way with her. Um, the book had different endings, um, but this is the ending of uh, one version of the book. And it is really different. I mean, I, um, I was looking at Yoshitoshi, the, um, the um, silk screen and wood block. Um, Japanese artist and I loved his bloody handprints and so I kind of stole that and put it on the right side but I think there's a similar tension to some of the Don Quixote and the other work of kind of these flat areas of undefined space um, mm -hmm. and what you know the figures kind of come in and out of the the flatness and the um, kind of imagination and unreality of the world. Well, it's, 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 it's a space uh, that doesn't quite belong to the rest of it, but at yeah. the same time, it gives you a sense of rest. Yes. If we go back quickly, Kyle, if you can help it from the very beginning of the same, the very first image of Natalie, um, of the, um, the Don Quixote, the second one maybe, or the third, I can't remember, but the same, maybe, yes you see the same use of the right there. Yeah. The flat space, the man's facing us behind. Exactly. Then function. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any depth perception. So I always try to put in some architecture to kind of ground the space, but I can never really get it right because I don't really have a sense of spatial depth. Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of is like this, little bit of reality in the drawing that structures things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good cubist device, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's go back, Kyle. I wanted to, I know that we didn't really choose any images of Baltus, but we'll, we'll, we'll can talk about him 
um, after we see the next sequels image because I know we have quite yes yeah what I want to talk about how it came about it uh, production seemed to be incredibly high high the production and and mm -hmm. very ambitious in this monumental scale so yeah. can you share with us how it came about so the the drawing center show traveled to the Blanton um, and Veronica Roberts curated the show there and is just a phenomenal person and brilliant scholar and she introduced me to Stephen Mills who's the head of Ballet Austin and he's involved with the museum and um, bought some drawings for the museum and one for himself and we got to be friends and maybe a year into our friendship he said would you ever want to and i was like yes 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 this is my dream please <laughs> and so um the butlers this wonderful couple in austin who are very connected to ut endowed ballet austin um with a couple million dollars to make new productions with contemporary artists and so i was the first and it was really stunning i mean stephen gave me complete freedom to hire a team of artists and so a set designer, costume designer, animator, um, and then those people brought in their teams of like wig makers and um, headdress makers and textile painters. And so everything was drawn, done from my drawings. And mm -hmm. I worked with the individual artists to animate my drawings, to um, create new drawings for the costumes, that then we even drew you know, the textures of pastel that he then hand painted um, for the costumes. And so we used about 30 of my drawings for the book and I made about a hundred new drawings for animations. All the sets were my drawings projected 20 by 30 feet um, with these incredible like double rear projectors where you could see the pastel flex. And then I painted, for instance, this headpiece um, and worked with everyone to, to kind of design the whole production. And it was such a thrill. Um, it premiered in Austin, you know, showing your work in a book or in a gallery to maybe, you know, 100 people at the opening or 10 of your friends and family members, um, but to show it on stage in front of 4,000 people and to see this world that has been in your head come to life was really extraordinary. And I think one of the, um, the most amazing opportunities I've had. Um, and it really ignited an interest to do more with um, ballet and opera. So. Here's a good ex example where one of your study from the pastel is blowing up mm -hmm. in that scale. Yeah, and you can see the dwarves. This is Snow White, um, um, sorry, Sleeping Beauty. And you can see that, uh, Snow White. You can see the dwarves were kind of reimagined as Weimar leather boys. Um, we had a great time inventing these characters and we excised the prince from the story. So uh, she runs off with the dwarves in the end in some kind of like menage, -a, like, I don't know set um and no prints so it was, it was great fun can we i think we have a few more to share with our yes these were some of the costumes for the frog prince um we did the frog king um snow white and the juniper tree so we looked at three tales all about um hunger sexual hunger physical hunger spiritual hunger and the frog king of course the princess has to sleep with the frog um, and, and honor her word. And so this is this couple. Um, he was a particularly amazing dancer. Beautiful. Go ahead, Kyle. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so this is the earlier work, am I right? So these are the Grimm's fairy tale drawings that the ballet was drew from and I was see. based on. Yeah. And this is the Bremen Town musicians. Um, one of the only actually four children fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. Um, the next drawing is from the juniper tree. Maybe we can go to the next one. Um, yeah. And that's a story that we did um, where the stepmother decapitates her stepson and then cooks him for dinner for the father. So these stories were not, were never intended for children. 
Yes, I know. They were great fun to draw. <laughs> with or without chicken broth or oregano, okay. <laughs> Probably doesn't matter at that point. <laughs> okay. And That's this fine. is the Frog King. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was interesting to animate some of these and, you know, we use this drawing for the ballet and the eyes would blink or the um, ball would fall in the well and the water would come out. Um, the next one is Briar Rose, which is Sleeping Beauty, mm -hmm. which was actually, of course, a rape scene um, where originally the father rapes the daughter and she wakes up breastfeeding her children. Mm -hmm. But in the Brothers Grimm version, it's a prince. Yep, I have the similar discussion, um, you know, with, with uh, Rachel at her show at uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish Museum, Feinstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, who also have this incredible long, lifelong obsession with this very narrative. Yeah. Um, and let me ask you, what is on top of the picture? It's just un undescribable. It's yeah. not easy to, de to decipher. So those are all of the suitors who were caught in the briar hedge um, that had overgrown the kingdom. And for me, they were just a mass of weight <laughs> above her <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the boudoir. Cool. It's nice not to know it uh, from the beginning. And yeah. this one? Cinderella. Mm -hmm. So that's when she calls on the birds to come and help her. They're kind of forming her body. And that's her again pictured in the fire um, place. And then that's her dancing with death. Can we see a, a, a close up of her feet, Cal? Just quickly, because I'm curious of, yeah, that area. They're just birds. Oh, yeah. Look how rough the pastel lay on top of the wash as if they are pigment falling off from butterflies' wings, no? That's beautiful. All <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Um, okay, Kyle. That satisfied my tinkle. All right. This Rapunzel. one? Rapunzel reuniting with her lover. Um, in their version, she becomes pregnant because every day she's climbing down to see the prince. Um, and, of course, you know, he's struck with blindness and forced to wander in the desert and then eventually they reunite. And so I was looking a lot at illustrated manuscripts and the way that information is organized with these kind of flourishes of graphic elements. Mm -hmm. so that's what that kind of U shape coming out of the squirrel tail <laughs> is all about. Yeah. With the wonky eyed bird above. And then the next image is, um, or the next two images are spreads from the book. Um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so all, all of the, I think there were 29 stories. Um, each one had their own title page and border. And then because these were the dark tales, um, the designer Marion Banshees put them on black. And so they were, each border was mirrored, but kind became this kind of fun house world all in black and white. Yeah. Is that the last image we have, Kyle? Natalie? I don't yeah. Know. yeah, I think so. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, we can talk longer, but I do have a few more questions for you, just so that we can cover all our bases. <laughs> um, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't manage to include a picture of Baltus, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, who, in a way, was a unique figure mm -hmm. in the height of uh, cubism and surrealism. And I don't know how to describe him. He doesn't fit to neither camps, you know? <laughs> and he was deadly on the course of making the paint that he was making pretty mm -hmm. much until he died, you know? And, um, and I don't know how... Are you, do you have any kinship with, with Baltus at all? Because 
in you know if if you if your picture get you know uh, cause offensive feeling among viewer occasionally, <laughs> so did his being a man, you know. Uh huh. And what are you feeling about that? You uh, know, I, I loved Balthus when I was younger, um, but then the way that he pictured women, I think similarly with Lucian Freud, um, yep. with a lack of empathy, felt distasteful and um, made me a little queasy. And I, I stopped liking him probably in high school. Um, I remember reading the Nicholas Fox Weber biography he was a total pathological liar, um, seemed to be anti-Semitic, was a real snob. And the more I looked at his work, those things came out for me. Um, and I wasn't interested in his like crotch shots of young girls and pussycats. It felt like it belonged to another time. Um, and so I really dislike his work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> well, what do you think? You Do you like his work, Fong? You know, I like the way he painted them. Yeah. You know, so I look at his different perspective. Right. Not so much the portrayal of the imagery, although I think that it's debatable how mm -hmm. the subject of American puritanical view on sexuality yeah. can be also very simplistic, uh, simplistically re re reductive, you know? I don't know. I, I have mixed feeling because I believe that when he was, I don't know, um, made first illustration of Guthrie Heights, you know, I think that's mm -hmm. a good place to begin with him because otherwise, why would he make illustration of the first quarter of the book or at least one quarter of the, the book, the beginning of it all, when he clipped and Kathy fell in love when life was beautiful mm -hmm. thing was pleasurable and feel of joy unlike the end in the book for some reason he just only illustrate the first half the beginning you know and i don't know i just felt there's something there where the entitlement of someone who decided that maybe i would live my life uh, like an adolescent you know <laughs> it's possible it's possible no more no less Maybe Jeff Kuhn doesn't have the same aspiration as a person, but I, I look at Jeff Kuhn's work. I think it's also a form of preserving, prolonging adolescent too. Uh -huh. Certain kind of, uh, you know, fixation on, on, on that, um, you know, prolonging of certain things. I don't know. That's how I see it. It's hard to tell, but we know that in France culture, in French culture, the understanding for children, childhood, is much differently than here. You know, it's more sympathetic to view a view of a child. You know, I think that you can certainly read that in literature through Alan Fournier, through Colette, you know, Jean, Jean Vigo, mm -hmm. Zero de Conduit, you know, is that. Through four film, uh, 400 Blows is another good example. I yeah. think we have a certain inferior controlling view of childhood. You were lucky because your mom didn't certainly didn't see you like that, <laughs> you know? Right. right. And I think, you know, these fairy tales are kind of about that, but I, I do have a problem with art when it seems to be like an older white man's masturbatory fantasies. And that's what Balthus feels like to me. Yeah. Um, you know, at least if I'm reading, like I'm reading Angela Carter's book, the Saudian, um, on Saad right now, Saudian women, woman. And, you know, to talk about Saad as like a risk taker or um, the way that he tests boundaries in his work. I think Balthus for me was like to take that subject matter and wrap it in retrograde painting style. I would much rather look at a Manet of like a vase of flowers that feels more revolutionary. Right, uh, right. So. It's, um, yeah. All right. Well, not that, no. why don't we sort of uh, open up to the uh, Q&A so that people have a chance to ask you yeah. questions or even further questioning on this issue. Um, the American puritanical <laughs> sexuality. 
Hello. Uh, yeah, seeing those images, I really, I want to go to the ballet now. Um, <laughs> so I've got quite a few questions. Thank you everyone for sending them in. I am going to start with Nicholas. Nicholas, I'm passing the mic over to you. Hi, can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Hi. 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 Uh, thanks for the discussion. It's very great. I totally agree about Balthus. Anyway, it's a different, different question. Uh, I'm curious if your shift sort of away from large scale oil painting, like I guess if I first encountered your work back, I don't know, 2006 or so at Mitchell Ennis and Nash. Um, and I'm curious if that shift away from that, maybe there isn't a total shift, uh, how that, if that's freed you in some way from like the, the burden of, you know, um, Western art history or like the masterpiece sort of thing. Um, I'm making an, an assumption, I guess, in that question, but the, I guess really I'm curious about how uh, the shift in media affects not just uh, the way you go about generating your work, but uh, your approach in terms of the weight that the media itself might carry with it in terms of mm. you know, oil paint, or marble, that sort of thing versus, yeah. you know, uh, I, I saw your, your recent ceramic pieces and <laughs> something that, well, there's something sort of like really delightfully like playful about them, but they're the scale of play and the scale of domestic objects for use and things like that. You know? Yeah. Thank you. That's such a nice question. So thoughtful. Um, I think it hasn't been, I don't know that it's about a weight of history or masterpieces or the, the history of oil painting, but it just drawing became a medium that I fell in love with. And I could do the, the kind of playful, perverted um, things that I wanted to do um, in art, in drawing, that I, and, and I hadn't been able to do that in painting. Um, I could use brighter key colors. I could, I could kind of destroy images, but still have them linger. There was just something specific to the combination of the gouache and chalk and, um, that felt liberating. And um, I think there was like a lack of preciousness or style. Um, and then kind of exploring these ideas in other forms has been really exciting too, because it feels like it's always surprising that my hand or my my eye is still there, but just in a different form. Like I've been working a lot at Dudonet, making handmade paper, um, paintings and those feel closest to what I've always wanted to do in oil painting, but they're all handmade paper. Um, and so I don't, these distinctions between like ceramic, drawing, books, ballet, like they kind of implode and I just kind of follow what brings me joy and um, the drawings and these other forms just bring me a lot of joy. Um, and so I, that's, that's what I do, <laughs> but thank you, yeah. Thank you, Nicholas and Natalie. Yeah, uh, next, I will pass the mic over to Alice. Alice, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, but uh, you should be able to... I can unmute myself, yes, yep. you did you indeed. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi from London. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, over here in Cambridge, England. So uh, I really enjoyed the talk, it's great. And I'm glad to join you guys on a, on a cold, wet evening here. Um, but I have a question which um, Natalie won't be surprised by, but um, <laughs> I'm curious about people who precede um, uh, Paula Rego and specifically women surrealists who uh -huh. took up the, if you like, the, the idea of the fairy tale and very much used it as a vehicle for perhaps re-educating adults through the story that supposedly gears towards the child. Um, and I'm also, so I'm curious whether you look to them. I mean, I, it's, it's mean to ask artists, you know, to name, <laughs> to name their own canon, let's say, but I am curious because they worked in text and image, if they inspired you. And if you looked at Leonore Fini's illustrations for the story of O specifically when you braved that tale yourself. <laughs> Absolutely, and thank you, Alice, and for everyone. Um, Alice had an amazing book come out on Saad and the avant-garde, and talks about Feeney and um, Angela Carter, and um, so yes, Feeney, Carrington, um, 
were incredibly influential. I loved the show that I think you were also involved in at the Museum of Sex on Leonor Feeney. Um, incredible show. I had never seen that much of her work before or really in person. Um, and I, I spent hours in that show. It, so yes, absolutely. Um, can you hear us? Oh, sorry, uh, mic, <laughs> mic issue. Alice, are you it's able? It's okay. I've been are. I've been muted. Wise wise person. Yeah. Yes, you muted me. But um, <laughs> I to to take you up further. Then what about the idea of the fairy tale, which in theory is what um, someone who can read reads to the person who can't read, and mm. the kind of flipping the power struggle. I'm wondering how you're taking that in a feminist way. So you know this idea that we we tell fairy tales to children to teach them the moral codes and mm -hmm. through this sort of gory, fantastic tales and the kid gets them usually in a way that the adult is too dense to get the, the fun part of them or to be able to think beyond the box. So yeah. I'm sort of wondering too whether you're, it's the, it seems to me more the, not the child and the adult, but specifically the gender roles that you're adamant about are they the struggle between the more passive females and active males that you're keen to flip? Um, you mean in the process, in the actual storytelling that one might tell a child? Yeah, in terms of kind of why you, you like that you the t storytelling specifically uh, well, I think and what you're trying to do with telling yeah. stories differently. I think because these stories, I love the idea that they started out between women and they were like yeah. told privately, like over the well or by the hearth or, um, and they were told not to children, but to, 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 to like say, you know, this is what happened to me or um, this is the peril of childbirth. Um, but I think in terms of the storytelling, I remember when my father read me fairy tales, I felt almost like he was the passive one as the storyteller, because mm -hmm. I could sit there and let my imagination run wild. And when I work with these stories, it's kind of like I inhabit both roles and I tell myself these stories as I read them. And that enables me to go out and just run wild. And it's, um, I'm kind of working both sides of it. Um, but yeah, and, and there's something, you know, I love about sharing, sharing women's stories that a lot of people don't know belong to women. And they, the Brothers Grimm sanitize their stories to try mm -hmm. to increase sales and added pictures. Um, but they were, you know, never meant for children. So mm -hmm. I like that idea of, um, you know, something like, Disney, which has been co-opted and dumbed down and stripped of its meaning, kind of bringing that back to its origins. Great, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Alice. <laughs> thank you. Uh, there's a lovely serendipity to our next question there. So I will pass the mic over to our dear friend, Lynn Crawford. Uh, Lynn should, okay. Oh no, Lynn, I'm not, I don't think we can hear you. Oh. Oh, there you are, there you are. <laughs> okay. Um, I, this is such a beautiful talk and I'm, I'm deeply impressed by your commitment to literature and visual art. Um, it's, it's phenomenal and I, um, and when this started, I immediately went to my bookcase and pulled out my Angela Carter, um, <laughs> woman, and also the bloody chamber. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about both those things uh, throughout your talk. And I think now I obviously have a different question since I know you're familiar with that. But when you just mentioned the joy that you infuse in this, you know, bleak, this, this blend of bleak and, and joy, um, which is very Angela Carter, mm -hmm. um, I just am curious. Well, I want to give you a compliment and say how wonderful that is, and also curious. Um, if you could speak about that a little bit, the, the duality. Yeah, thank you. Um, I love her so much. Um, the next book, actually, the one of the next books I want to do is a collection of her children's stories, which prefigure a lot of the themes that come out in the Bloody Chamber um, that have never been collected. And um, there's, I would say, I would substitute the word for me, ferocity instead of bleakness, because I feel like her voice and intellect and passion are so ferocious. Yeah. And it's not about, I think, 
for me, showing the world as bleak or menacing or scary, but just as it is. And I think as it is for women. And that's not, I mean, coming back to Linda Nochlin, that's not a viewpoint that we're accustomed to. Um, and that's what's really important to me. And I'm, yeah, I'm, her work is so bold and I would love to do something with the bloody chamber, make an opera out of it or something. Um, oh. Yeah. What do you tell me, is the bloody chamber one of her favorite pieces of yours? It's a series of rewritten fairy tales. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's a really great thing to read with the Sadian women because yeah. it's like you have the, the art and the theory yeah. at once. And your word for um, ferocious or voracious is so much better than bleak, you're right. But I think this whole thing with uh, Marquis de Sade as a feminist uh -huh. icon because there, there's not reproductive penetration in his writing is a really interesting feminist take on someone who's often considered, you know, misogyny, misogynist. Yeah. Yeah. But also she kind of goes further and says, you know, he was a coward. Like he, totally. yeah, he had the guts to push it far, but not quite, you know, where um, the child was fornicating and then murdered the parent. Um, yeah. There was still a little bit of a happy ending going on. Right. And not, yeah. not in the Tubin sense of happy ending, but um, yeah. But it's interesting, you know, Lynn, uh, thinking about now when you go back and, you know, I don't remember the last time I read that book, it's been a while, but when I read it, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, um, famous book, you know, M Must We Burn Sad, remember? Mm -hmm. And it, it just, I remember quite, quite vividly, um, it's, you know, not because its name gave rise to the phenomena of sexual sadism, uh, but it's also how the notion of burning also, you know, must, should we be burned? Should we burn him like the way that we burn books or the way we burn um, um, Joan of Arc, you know? So it's a very interesting account in addition to sexual libertinism um, and, um, and the way that how she also was very much admiring his prose, his writing style. <laughs> so it, it was properly complicated on both sense, you know, mm -hmm. senses, both sides of reading him in that account. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's it's survived. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it survived in our, our consciousness, and we still find it um, compellingly important to read in there. Uh, this is where the the, the notion of selling story, as you do, without having it completely making it explicitly accessible. You mm -hmm. know, you have to exercise your own pictorial invention, all kind of. Uh, pictorial requirement uh, at your fingertips, you know? Um, is you're not making these images for children, really. No, not at all. <laughs> 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 for the type of children I'd want to have. But exactly. <laughs> <laughs> while, we're, um, while we're sort of on that topic, I hope you don't mind, GE, but I'm reading from the chat. Um, GE said, uh, Kathy Acker's retellings come to mind. Uh, what is your impression of Carrington's writings? I have not read Carrington's writings. Um, so thank you for um, pointing that out. Cool. Yeah. What, what is G.E. Schwartz, um, could, could they share about um, what they're thinking about regarding yeah. Carrington? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the program. Um, no, mainly um, her fiction, which mm -hmm. is wonderful, yeah. very much along the lines of fairy tales, very yeah. surrealistic. Mm -hmm. Much muted sexuality, but mm -hmm. then some explicit sexuality. Mm -hmm. The symbolism is amazing and yeah. beyond Jungian and many other things. It's wonderful. It's the, both the short stories and her novels are wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, GE. Um, 
Wonderful. So I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Lynn, also. Um, I am going to pass the mic over to Brian. Brian, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, BR and Fong and Natalie for this talk. Um, Paul Arego has been really talked about a lot and just a little plug for this side of the pond, the Irish Museum of Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin are having a retrospective of Regos at the minute, but currently locked down. Um, but there's a conversation in her studio um, tomorrow, I think, but that's just beyond the point. Um, Natalie, thank you so much for this talk. Um, do you mind if the viewer creates their own narrative, um, like say from their personal experience, rather than from the story depicted, um, because the stories are so um, so intense from their literal inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you mind if, if people bring their own baggage, as it were, to them? No, I don't think you can, you can experience the world without bringing your own baggage or stories or personal experience. And all of these stories came from personal experience. So they might have been codified and written down, but the amount that they've changed through the centuries is kind of staggering. And I think that's kind of the point is that people, people read them, internalize them and go and live their life with them in, in their mind. Make sense of them for their, for their own selves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited. I was really wanting to see that um, Rigo show um, before everything shut down. Um, and I know she has something coming up at the Tate as well in a few years, um, but I'd love to come and see that show. Are you in Ireland? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Northern Ireland at the minute. Okay, okay. Have you seen, did you see the exhibition before it closed? No, um, I had a ticket booked and then locked down Mm, yeah. Uh, they, they reinforced the lockdown again and then it was a no-go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, me too. I hope <laughs> we can send you we send you all the good juju to hopefully see yeah. that show. Yeah. You know, um uh, I, I meant to um mention we didn't manage to add another images of the paint that we kind of mentioned a little bit last night, uh which is uh, R. B. Kitai, um, mm. Natalie, and and who's also part of, of Polo Rigo, that whole London school, you know? Yeah. But he's an American artist, um, although spent much of his time there, most of his time there, his life there in England. Yeah. Um, he, he, you know, his work for the longest time, I didn't quite understand, although I know he had significant influence on British pop art, mm -hmm. um, because I never quite, uh, know how to respond to his bright color, hmm. elegant use of line, yeah. overlapping planes, and yeah. sort of a collage mm -hmm. repertoire that he was really good at. Yeah. But I must admit, um, not until uh, Peter Glenaway, mm -hmm. who spoke so beautifully and how, so eloquently how Kitai had an immense influence on his, his filmic. Oh, interesting. Uh, invention yeah. in his masterpiece in late uh, 80s. <laughs> I remember seeing it. I was completely bowled over. The cook, the thief, his wife and her lover. <laughs> Fantastic film. And I think in, in some way, um, the, 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 uh, the aspiration to operatic or theatrical design for that sort of uh, filmic, perhaps, mm -hmm. ability it's already been embedded in, in your work. So oh, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, the ballet um, and all the things that would consequently might occur after. Yeah, I love his work. Um, Barry Schwabsky put together a wonderful show a couple of years ago at Marlboro. And um, I met the Katai group and the estate then, and we've been plotting about doing a show um, together since, um, which is something I would love to do because he's been a tremendous influence on me. Such a humanist, um, master storyteller. He did so many different forms of art as well. Um, graphic work, painting, book covers, really engaged with literature. Um, 
just an amazing drafts person. Yes. Also know how to do pastel too. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to you, Nikki. I think we... Well, thank you, Fong. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, I got a couple others, direct ones. I'm sorry we didn't get to go to all of them, but we have a tradition here at the rail of ending our conversations with a poetry reading. Uh, today, we are thrilled to welcome Gina Marie O oh to the stage. Uh, just a very quick bio, and I will pass the mic over to them. Uh, born in Manapla, Philippines, Gina Marie Lowe is a poet and editor currently based in Western Massachusetts. They are the author of a series of unnatural disasters and the chapbooks No Filter and Ephemera and Atmospheres. And without further ado, Gina Marie, I am passing the mic over to you. Um, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Natalie and Fong, for this conversation and everybody at the Brooklyn Rail um, for all the work that you guys do to make these events happen. Um, it's really special. Um, so I'm going to read just a few poems from a manuscript in progress called um, Punk Punctum. Hi. Hello. How are you? What do you do for money, for fun? What do you actually love? What are you making? How did you get here? Were you very afraid? Are you hungry? What do you want to eat? What do you believe in? Tell me about your life. Tell me about your family. How do you define family anyway? I am compelled by your practice. Do you want to tell me about it? Do you want to hear about mine? I'm out of practice extending in hope of an equivalent reach, a deep dive, moving beyond the approximate, peripheral, trying to catch that ephemeral thing, ephemeral affinity, ephemeral connection, ephemeral orientation, ephemeral orange fading into pink, fading into purple in the firmament behind my head and your head, take a picture of it. Ephemeral moment in the karaoke room, late night ephemeral, ephemeral wave from the other end of the dance floor, a rare ephemeral encounter, leading finger tracing along my back, I'm glad you are here. Texture and warmth, moving umbrage collected in the above time, cutting the calm, cool comfort of conditioned room, make legible a warning, in writing, above, not before, later than, next in time or place, the indefinite now. There doesn't appear to be anything here. A point on a plane, again haunted by a particularity of relation. Wonder where are we meant to be? Wonder what they were thinking about when it happened. Wonder with excruciating detail, wonder everything terrible, wonder with a kind of exuberance, wonder how to burn it all down, and then wonder how it would feel to begin again. Punctum of my love, tending to a weed, turning into a wildflower, overwintering under fatty crayon finger, incitement of aggregated material, planted rather than the literal touch all the wintering in balmy dried cleft, different than the other one. Hungry and thinking about dinner, upon waking, a trumpet, heavy woolen blanket, lay it on thick. I appreciate being privy to flailing pure elation down the hallway. How do you know you've made a good choice? How do you know you could have made a better choice? Don't worry, baby, in the living room, a patterned affect, tiny archipelago waving a wave. I devour the flower in bloom. Do you feel that? A physical form talking around an interpretation. I am floating above one city, another city, now and again a third when the air is clear, elaboration unfolding, movement and relation. What could happen next? What do we need other than luck? 
I'm out of practice, note, move ahead, no burden, dead zone, framework, vulnerability, armature, more than one line to hold. Did you feel that? Thank you. Snapping and clapping virtually. Thank you so much, Gina and Marie. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Natalie and Fong, for your wonderful conversation. Uh, we do these conversations every day at 1 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, we will be hosting our Radical Poetry Reading, organized by Cole Swenson and featuring readings by Etel Adnan, Amit Dubwedi, apologies if I mispronounced that, Susan Howe, and Guzzle Mozadek. Uh, I also want to share that October is the Rails 20th anniversary, so uh, we are committed to, you know, remaining free and accessible to everyone, and we do that through events like this and through, of course, the Rail itself. Uh, so I want to thank you all once more, and you all should be able to uh, activate your mics to say hello or goodbye on your way out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Natalie. Thank, you, Natalie. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were, so, you were supposed to be doing this in the. <laughs> so busy all the time. It's ridiculous. A great session. <laughs>